feeling of life itself. He defines consciousness as the feeling of life itself, which all of us, we have. Now there is a huge bridge, minute bursts of electricity and compare it with the experience each of us is having right now. When I'm seeing you, when I'm uh, uh, hearing you, when I'm thinking, feeling, these are not minute bursts of electricity. It's color and shape, a, a direct first person experience. And when you look at from a ex externally, when you look at the, um, the what's going on, electrical activity in the brain, that's not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, desiring, thinking, understanding, hating, you know, uh, inspiration, creativity. No. You see, one must appreciate the huge explanatory gap here. One might say right here, uh, what's the problem? Those bursts of electricity are causing it. Right? From a Vedantic perspective, this is a huge, what we might call a category error. Why is it a category error? Um, once, I was talking with another philosopher and he is a, he is a biologist, uh, Massimo. He teaches at, uh, um, I think, uh, at City College in, in New York, I think. Or City University of New York, CUNY. So he's a biologist and um, a neuroscientist also. A, neuro a biologist and, and a philosopher of mine. And he said, look, I'm convinced that consciousness is nothing but something that is produced by a living brain. That's it. Uh, and uh, he says, I cannot explain it yet. He admits the gap, the explanatory gap between minute electrical activity observed in a living brain, uh, in the tissues of a living brain, and our vivid experience of life. How is it, how are the two connected? He says, I cannot explain it yet. But his argument was, look, this gap, uh, it, it's not a big deal because... Uh, even a hundred years back, people were saying that you cannot explain life. Uh, science cannot explain life. But today, we understand life down to its uh, molecular level. The molecular processes which go to constitute what we call life. We understand that now. And for me, that's enough explanation. So give us time. Uh, us means neuroscientists. Give us time and we will explain how consciousness is produced uh, from physical processes in a living brain. So this is called promissory materialism. I can't, it's, it's a real thing. If you Google it, you will find it. It's, it's a really big thing. <laughs> Promissory materialism. Um, I can't explain it now, but I will be able to explain it later. Just give me some more time. For, for the time being, you must accept that somehow physical processes produce consciousness. Now, what could be the objection against this? The objection from a Vedantic perspective. From a Vedantic perspective, there's a huge objection. Here is the objection. And these are insights actually we can share in, in the, the dialogue. Why is promissory materialism not acceptable? Because of this. I said, my reply to him was, look, when you say, I, ex I have now understood life uh, in terms of more fundamental processes. Life is a complex, higher order process and you reduce it down to more fundamental processes, down to the cellular level, down to even uh, uh, to the molecular level, as you have said. Great. From an Advaitic perspective, what have you done? You have understood a complex objective process in terms of more fundamental objective processes. Remember, what's the definition of object in Vedanta? Anything that is experienced in consciousness, that is presented to consciousness, is an object. Whatever you can experience is an object. It could be something external, it could be something mental also. These are all objects. Life is an objective process. Molecular processes you find in experimentation and observation, these are objective processes. That you have explained in terms of this. But now when you say, I am going to explain consciousness, which is not an objective process, we will see, why not? It's not an objective process in terms of objective processes. Then you, you see, you are making a jump. You are making what, what can be called in philosophy a category error. He did not take it well. Uh, I mean, either he didn't get what I was trying to say or it's not a valid thing. Now, remember, we must keep our minds open. As neuroscientists are keeping their minds open, explanations from Vedanta, Buddhism, all of these traditions, interesting, let's hear them out. From our perspective also, it should not be a done deal. Remember, in, in Indian philosophy also, there's a whole range of views on consciousness. There is the Nyaya Vaisheshika view of consciousness, very different from the Advaita view of consciousness. Though, if you go deeper into it, it's not so different at all. There is the Sankhya view of consciousness and the Advaita view of consciousness. There are various schools of Buddhism with various grades of understanding of consciousness. 
the Jaina idea of consciousness. So the, in ancient Indian philosophical discourse, there was this whole spectrum of views of consciousness. Yeah, I mean, it's very tempting to give a very neat idea that this is the ancient Indian understanding of consciousness and here is what we can share with uh, modern science. No, it's not all that neat. Yeah, it's much more messy than that, but it's much more interesting also. Yeah. It's much more interesting. I, rem I remember reading a paper by Patricia Churchland and she says that uh, philosophy of mind is not the way to understand the mystery of consciousness. We are doing neuroscience. We need to keep on doing more neuroscience and one day we will understand the mystery of consciousness. This is again promissory materialism. Huh. I don't agree. It's not Now, this has to be taken carefully. So is it that doing more neuroscience is not necessary? It is necessary. First of all, we live in an age of science. We would be doing less than justice to our own philosophical traditions if we are not open to science. I am sure the great masters of the Advaita tradition, whether it is Shankara or uh, and this is the land of Vidyaranya, uh, the, the author of the Panchadashi, or, or so many others. The kind of mind that you see working in those texts, if they were here today, they would be completely engaged with, with science. They would be very happy to uh, you know, take insights from science and investigate the scientific approach. So, even to understand our ancient philosophical spiritual traditions, we must engage with science. And the other way around, there is something that I, I firmly believe that these philosophical schools, especially Advaita Vedanta, can help in the uh, investigation into consciousness. So both ways. But why is it that I said that I don't think further investigation in, uh, uh, in neuroscience will actually solve the mystery of consciousness in the sense that we will be able to explain it from matter to consciousness. That is, I am rem reminded of a little quote from Ed Witten. Uh, he is in Princeton. He is a string theorist, not a neuroscientist, not a Vedantist or philosopher. He is a string theorist, but a brilliant man nevertheless. And uh, some interview I was watching, um, and there, uh, quite off the topic, it's not a, something related to physics, somebody asked, what about the mystery of consciousness? So do you think uh, by neuroscience we'll solve the mystery of consciousness? And he made a very perceptive remark. This is somebody, a very intelligent, powerful, intelligent mind from outside the field. Neither philosophy nor neuroscience. From outside the field, a powerful, intelligent mind observing this, and he says, I think as we do more neuroscience, we will learn more and more about the brain. But consciousness will still remain a mystery. So this observation is actually the basis of this dialogue which we are having. I feel with the traditions we have in India for centuries, millennia of investigation into consciousness and the new booming interest in consciousness studies in brain science, in computer science, uh, in the philosophy of mind, we will. We are at a very exciting time. We will uh, uh, get new, powerful understandings, theoretical as well of something of practical use. Also, I think, just like the American Psychiatric Association feels that a partnership between spirituality and psychiatry can be very helpful. Um, I was reading this book by Evan Thompson. He's a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia in in Vancouver, and um, he's he's written this book. Um, waking, Dreaming, Being, Consciousness from Modern Neuroscience and Vedantic and Buddhist Perspectives. In the very beginning he says, Consciousness Studies is not a new field. It's a very ancient field. It goes all the way back to the Upanishads of India. 5,000 years ago, that was, they were the first people to investigate consciousness and they re reached dramatic results. And he gives a quote from another philosopher in that book. Um, he says, and this is from a person who is not a Vedantist. He says that the Upanishads are such a remarkable development in human civilization that I believe our dating system should not be AD and BC. It should be before Upanishad, after Upanishad. He finds it so powerful. And then he talks about the Mandukya Upanishad, the waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Now, Let's take this in a few sta uh, stages and see what insights we can get from uh, Vedanta, from Indian philosophy. Something that can keep the dialogue going. By the way, I am not going to promise and I don't see easy results coming. If easy results were coming, they would have come long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we are really investigating the ultimate subject. And there's a play on words, the subject itself, consciousness, which is you or I. 
The interesting thing here is, when you talk about something like black holes or super strings, now these are so esoteric, these are so super specialized that uh, only a few people with the requisite mathem 